In the world of mascot horror, a few games reign supreme. We've got the greats like Five Nights at Freddy's, Bendy and the Ink Machine, and of course, Sussy Poppy Playtime. But of course, with greatness, there come the cheap imitations. We could sit here for hours going over every one for every game series, but I think the most fascinating ones come from Poppy Playtime specifically. You definitely already know about a certain popular one, and if you haven't, can I come live under that rock with you? We're not going to go over Garten of Ban Ban today, no. That's honestly been done to death and I'm not sure what more I can add to the conversation. I've been seeing YouTubers touching on some new releases that stuck out to me as being kind of funny looking, and upon investigating, I found a new rabbit bowl full of a pile of bootleg huggy wuggies like no one has ever heard of before, and rightfully so, honestly. These games are, to put it lightly, not works of art, but there's so much more to it than that. I have like a whole theory about why this started. It starts with the game known as Joyville, released in August 2023. Joyville has you traversing an abandoned children's play place, where one day, all of the children and employees suddenly went missing. Sound familiar? This game, I will clarify, isn't bad at all. The environmental design of this game definitely has thought put into it. It controls well, and the monsters, while a tad unoriginal, make sense as children's mascots and did have the ability to look threatening when used correctly. I especially liked the use of the worm that gradually looks hungrier and hungrier as you screw up its wheel puzzle. Given that it doesn't follow you with its eyes until you've made a mistake, I like that it could have been mistaken for a statue. The game also has decent puzzle design, my favorite puzzle being one with blocks where I needed to determine which to place down and when in order to have the right doors open, allowing me to eventually gather all blocks to one side of the room to open a door. The game uses a teddy bear as its tool gimmick, which, albeit weird, is harmless. Overall, Joy Joyville was a decent experience that I would say deserves a look, but perhaps not a play until it's on sale because I'm not sure it's worth $10 given it only lasted half an hour. This game got noticed by the bigwigs, Daco, Fusion Z Gamer, it seemed like making a mascot horror game was still open as a quick ticket to fame just by looking at how Wooly Bully here looks so close to Huggy and yet was still getting views. Therefore, a bunch of young devs with starry eyes got to work in their engine of choice to invent their very own monster desperately in need of a trip to the dentist, and now that a lot of them are wrapping up development, we're where we are now. Tons of mascot horror game trailers are popping up left and right. Looking on YouTube right about now, if you search for new mascot horror game trailer, sort by views and just scroll for a while, eventually you'll start to see a bunch of low to average view count videos posted within the last three months advertising their new mascot horror games trailer, similarly worded each time, and each one has about the same aesthetic of rainbow halls and abandoned play areas. Just to list the ones I found simply by scrolling, we have... Happy Place, Sunny Spot, Riney's Kindergarten, Snakey's Complex, Moozy, Toytopia, Playtown, Circus of Tim Tim, Are You Kidding Me, Teddy's Tangled Tales, Candy World, Funler, Bobo's Fun Zone, and Baki. Probably leagues more I don't know about. I'm genuinely curious to see if any of these experiences are actually good, but if I were to sit here and cover every single one of these, this video would be like two hours long, and I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. So for your viewing pleasure, I have selected three of the games listed, Moozy, Playtown, and Toytopia, and we are going to go through them and see what works and what doesn't. From game-breaking bugs to just poor game design choices, we're going to see why these games aren't getting noticed and if they're worth your money, because yes, None of them are free. All right, let's put some new friends through the ringer for your entertainment. I'm Glamrock Dusky, and these are the most shameless mascot horror games. All right, first up, we have a little game called, well, the name of this game has been the topic of much debate, but I'm just going to go with Moozy. Moozy was originally introduced to the world as a demo released in December of 2023, later releasing its full version on February 13th, 2024, and it costs $5 to play. Developed by Andrew Ribas, Moozy places you in the shoes of a detective. You are a private investigator, and one day you get an assignment to inspect the abandoned Maybetty Industrial Complex. When you're done reading that, you are unceremoniously plopped down in the lobby of a complex and left to your own devices. We also discover that we are apparently wearing the loudest high heels known to man, so if running doesn't work, maybe we can at least make the monsters go deaf. 
off. Flipping a few switches on the wall to turn on the lights, we're instructed to go find a kid's gun. This toy gun is this game's gimmick. Every game we'll cover today has one. It's all presumably inspired by Poppy's Grab Pack and Ban Ban's drone. What's different about this toy gun is that you literally barely ever have to use it. Sure, it's fun to use, but it means next to nothing in the way of legitimate progression. I say legitimate progression because you can use the gun to hit physics objects around, and nearly everything in this game is a physics object. And you also have the ability to jump, so sequence breaking is hilariously easy. Good luck escaping once you're in, though. I do like the physics objects here, though. You can actually pop the balls with your gun, and different objects sometimes have different foley, aka the noises they make when being pushed or when they roll across the ground, which is a nice touch. It's fun to just kick stuff around while the game gets pushier and pushier about nudging you towards progress with its increasingly more hand-holdy hints. After completing the only, and I mean the only, puzzle that uses the gun in the entire game, we gain access to the playroom, which is accompanied by a very short music loop that gets annoying to the point that a way to turn it off was added in a patch. Here, we have to find four keys. One is lying on the ground as we enter, but the others are more complicated. The orange key is only complicated because it's hidden, so by default, you'll look for a puzzle to complete to acquire it, and you'll come across this thing that you can get to spit out a flying fan ball. Shooting this ball destroys it, and it can be a massive pain to catch, but when you do, the machine will spit out a star plushie. That's not a key, though, so where is it? 20 minutes of ball shooting later because I swear I thought the orange key was in one of them, I gave up and looked at a guide. Turns out it's just behind this block over here. The next two keys actually do require puzzles. We need to step on the correct shapes as indicated by papers on the wall, while this big snake that used to look like Huggy Wuggy makes really uncomfortable rubber noises. On completion of the game, it will then throw up the key and leave. For the red key, we need to parkour up a bunch of pillars and grab it from a ledge. If you fail too much at it, the game will simplify the puzzle for you, but you can go to the panel nearby and fix that if you're a sadist like me. The snake game has a panel as well if you had trouble with it. For the pink key, we need to navigate this maze, which can barely be called a maze as there's really only one path through. That path changes as you progress though, which is kinda neat. At the end, you're jump scared by this guy, who dies after about three seconds of making me one noise I would have never expected to come out of him. On our way out of the maze, we'll see this little guy holding up text I can't quite decipher and seemingly asking for a yellow key. You can find the key in a room later on, and if you give it to the creature, which is then later confirmed to be called Moon Girl, it will reward you with a grabber tool you can use to pick up objects. Moosey is the only game I'm looking at today that has a secret quest like this, so props to it for that extra bit of replayability. With all the keys, we can head into the lobby again to obtain a keycard and a new gun to replace the one we never used. Okay? The keycard lets us into an elevator that goes to an underground lab of some sort. Turning on the lights with a nearby breaker, we find that held in this underground lab are a weirdly cheeked up robot and another combination we can arrange the breaker switches in to unlock a new room. I think this is a neat puzzle. Using the same panel to unlock and relock things is needed. In the newly unlocked room, we are greeted with the rare and threatening Alpha Muzi and a Beta Muzi who promptly rearranges the bones in my face. If only I had Sigma Muzi to defend me. Beta Muzi is easily locked out, as most beta muzies are, allowing us to detour into a nearby room to unlock a safe with a set of possible codes that were harder to find than anything I've ever experienced before. They're on the table right next to it. The key card inside simply unlocks the gate outside that closed on us for no reason five seconds ago. But perhaps it's good that it did, because Alpha Muzi is back for revenge! And he's faster than us, so maybe don't sit around and try to take pictures for your thumbnail. Reaching the end of the hallway closes the gate on his face and no amount of gamer rage wall punching will let the monster mouse in to follow us down the stairs to the end of Moosey's first chapter. My thoughts on Moosey? Definitely not the worst game on my list, but no real winner either. It's only about 20 minutes long if you know what you're doing, and it's barely more than a walking simulator physics sandbox. Plus, the jump scares are trying way too hard to be the joy of creation. It's more loud equals scary than anything. The ending with Alpha Muzi banging the gate actually clips the audio system of the game itself, it's so loud. 
That being said, the game does a decent job at explaining its actual enemies, the Muzis, lore-wise, and at making them look threatening. Normally, you'd think you could probably punt one of these things across several soccer fields, but them being robots actually makes their strength make a lot more sense. Especially with the aforementioned door slamming that really puts that strength into perspective. I do have to wonder what kid would want this in their bedroom, though. Excuse me. I need your help. You need to kill me. One more note is that the patch notes of this game read like they were written by ChatGPT, which is inconsequential, but it is funny. Copter self-destruct. The stakes are higher. The flying copter can now self-destruct if not taken down in time. Keep your wits about you and make every shot count to avoid explosive consequences. Anyway, Muzi may have been kind of boring and weirdly designed, and the puzzles may feel largely pointless with their solutions often just lying on the floor nearby, but this developer definitely has potential. There are clear hints that the dev isn't entirely unaware of what makes a good game. You can see that in the difficulty adjustment panels for the minigames, and the controls feel decent. The game has secret things hidden around too, like different colored guns and the Moon Girls quest. And the models, lighting, and animations aren't bad either. I think the dev just needs some practice, and I believe they're somewhat young. The longer they keep making games, the better those games will get. Muzi has a chapter 2 currently in development, so I hope to see improvements and I will definitely be checking it out. Next up, we have Playtown. This one is special, and not in a good way. Playtown was incredibly broken, and it had the absolute most questionable environmental design I've ever seen in a mascot horror game. And I've played Garden of Ban Ban with its literal kindergarten ball pit abyss that the employees treat like an everyday nuisance. Grabbing things that fell into the abyss and... and the, <laughs> the casual it's abyss of the kindergarten. Problem. Playtown released in full on November 20th, 2020 and was developed by TNP Games for publishing by Mascot Bro Studio, who, as the name suggests, dabbles exclusively in trying to make the next big mascot horror craze to varying degrees of success. Playtown costs $8 to play and lasts about 20 minutes, so that better be a damn good 20 minutes. So, Steg, is it? In Playtown, you play as what is probably a young girl named Claire, looking for a necklace she lost in the now-closed Playtown, this necklace having been given to her by her late mother. Her dad honestly guilt-trips her into this, it sounds like. What the heck, dude? We start off in what looks like a reception room, and instantly I hate how this game controls. The mouse is very sensitive, and there isn't any way to turn that down, plus the motion blurring is very intense. You also jump like you're on the moon, but that's not really important right now. Only a few doors work in this room. I discover a room full of rice first. Premium rice. No idea why this is here. It's not like we can take a handful and use it to blind our enemies later, so let's try another door. In another room, there's a button that we can turn to activate something, which is not threatening at all, so of course I do it. The something in question just turns out to be another door, leading into a room with three other doors, marked as employee training, steg area, and playground area. We can only access the playground at first, and inside we find the crystal machine alongside two more doors leading out into a hallway where we can go left or right. Going left, we are greeted by a giant green dinosaur who is able to grab us through the wall, resulting in a pretty funny looking jump scare. One thing I can appreciate about this game is that it at least doesn't take any time at all for you to respawn after dying. None of that press E to reincarnate stuff like Muzi and Ban Ban do. Coming back from that, heading through the right door greets us with a very familiar looking platforming section. Can we stop putting platforming sections in mascot horror or just in horror in general? Doesn't make any sense! It didn't work in Ban Ban and it doesn't work here. Who in their right mind would have kids taking leaps of faith before they learn their colors? Besides, it's just cheap padding. We can all tell you're just trying to get to the two hour runtime so that getting a Steam refund is at least slightly harder. Well, it won't work because I love platformer games. I'm the best there has ever been at platformer games. Behold! <laughs> Don't look at that! 
After only 20 minutes of pure, efficient parkour rivaled only by the gods, we arrive at a very dusty and very small play area. This is the one part of the game that I feel makes sense. This looks like an appropriately sized kindergarten-esque area that I could see really existing, so I'll give them credit for that. On the way here, we picked up a few dino teeth, and this is where they come in handy. In what's just a direct copy of Ban Ban's collection puzzles, we need to find 10 of these teeth. Except these teeth are an off-white and not a bright blue, so they are a bit more annoying to find. While we're getting those, I want to say something real quick. Garden of Ban Ban got famous because it was bad. It had bad game design, bad graphics, bad everything. So why are so many mascot horror devs straight up stealing parts of it and then just reskinning them to put in their own games. It's possible that the reason for Ban Ban's popularity is being misinterpreted. Copying parts of it doesn't make your game better, it just infects it with the bad that Ban Ban had. Try saying that three times. And that kind of publicity stunt is really only going to work once because now we know better than to give so much notoriety to something that's clearly just trying to make a quick buck. At least we better know better. If you're gonna copy Ban Ban, at least copy its price tag aka make your game free. That way, more people will play it because they won't feel like they're gambling on whether it's good or not, and you'll naturally get more of an audience. And you will retain more of that audience's goodwill as well. Okay, rant over. Collecting all the eggs grants us a crystal that we can return to the crystal machine to be granted access to the Steg area. This is the home of that big bad strangely hairy dinosaur himself. Heading in, we are met with a series of tubes. Some of these tubes are deadly to walk by and some are not. Not. And a very smart guy, this is sarcasm, decided to put the sign that tells you which are safe behind and above you when you walk through the door, so you probably won't even see it. Also, I don't really know why these tubes are deadly. Nothing is in them, so I guess there's just really strong suction or something. Steg is waiting at the end of the hall in all of his hairy glory. He trots off before we can reach him so that he can take a nice bath in the lake. Him treading water here is the absolute least threatening thing he could be doing here. He's not even an aquatic dinosaur. Even him dancing would be scarier. Also, he makes absolutely no effort to catch you even if you fall in. If you do, you just drown, so I guess he really did just want to take a dip. It's also at this point that I got stuck running. Or at least I got stuck with the camera looking like I'm running, but I'm not actually going any faster, so it looks like my character is just really excited to get moving at all times. Skull emoji. Reaching the other side of the lake, we can turn a button that I assume flushes Steg or something because he's gone when you turn around. You can head out of the lake area now by traversing another set of murder tubes to get to Steg's cave, where we are informed not to worry about our kids, which makes me immediately worry about my kids despite not having any. Steg is waiting for us in the mouth of his cave, but he flees when he is exposed to our horrible ugliness, so we have to lure him out by cooking a definitely not still edible raw steak we find in the corner of the room on the campfire near the cave. Why we want to lure him out is beyond me, but I died to him on purpose in the chase scene that happened after, and at recently spawned me inside of him, resulting in him becoming harmless. He really is just a silly little guy. A green crystal waits for us in the doorway out of the hall, and this one unlocks the employee training. Entering that, we can find a Chaos Emerald. This Chaos Emerald can open doors, as Chaos Emeralds are known to do. I see how it is. Allowing us access to the first round of employee training, platforming over deadly lava. If there's anybody that deserves more than 15 an hour, it's Playtown employees. Jesus. Next up on the itinerary is taking a nice break, then braving the fucking lion pit! Oh look, they're having a nice conversation! Last up is anvil dodging. Not nearly as bad, considering you can kinda just walk around their range and they don't even fall on you if you don't. Now I have to log in with my diamond. To another door at the end of the hall and find more anvils as well as our fluffy friend who gets into prime crushing position and then politely waits for the anvil to fall on him and kill him. We pick up the last crystal on our way out and pass a few more expertly designed characters. This is sarcasm again, that's literally just Steg with mascara on, but slay I guess. At the end of this final hallway, there waits a bottle of Steg elixir. Are we gonna become the next Steg? That would actually be a cool plot point, but who needs to find out because we start hallucinating about our dead mom instead. The transformation is underway. <laughs>
Anyway, that's the end of Playtown. Stay tuned for Playtown 2. For the love of God, just make them chapters, not new games! In case it wasn't obvious, I do not like this game. It was definitely rushed, and I don't see the love in it. But for the sake of fairness, I am going to specify that I could see this working if the developer is willing to take a step back and reevaluate what they are actually trying to accomplish with this game series. Are you just making it to be noticed? As a game developer myself, I am very insistent that you need to have passion for what you're working on. Making something just to get a quick 15 minutes of YouTube fame is going to burn you out pretty quick, and you're going to start hating your creations. The idea of a dinosaur-based play place is an interesting one. I used to go to this place called Monkey Joe's when I was growing up. That was a monkey and jungle-themed play place. These things do exist, but you can't just slap whatever in and call it. Be innovative, but in a way that makes sense. Pick something to make stand out and then go all in with it. The standout factor of Garden of Banban, hear me out, is its plot. It's going all out with that, having a charming way of not taking itself seriously, and I dare say it's actually been getting me interested. It is the first popular mascot horror game where the antagonists are not people turned into monsters, but rather monsters that just think they are the people that gave them life. Despite the game's confusing quality, it knows what it wants to be and doesn't stray from the path. This is the one thing you should be stealing from Ban Ban, and this is a message for all mascot horror wannabes, not just Playtown's devs. Know what you want to be and have confidence in that. Sorry I went on a bit of a rant there. I'm just passionate about this stuff. Would you believe the next game is worse? Maybe not, but still, it's time for... This section is gonna be a bit awkward to do for reasons we'll discuss in a minute, but let's get the introduction out of the way. Toytopia was published by Mascot Bro Studio, just like Playtown. I'd honestly be interested in finding out what their quality control standards are because both of these games have mixed reviews on Steam. They also have a fair few refunds. As for the developer, this time it was Combo Bomb Games. Yeah, you got the bomb part right at least. Toytopia came out on February 19th, 2024 so it's pretty recent at the time of recording this, and it costs $8 to play. Now normally, this would be where I transition into some nice clean footage of me beating the game, but, um, I don't have clean footage of Toytopia because I was actually unable to beat it and have since refunded it. Now don't you go saying skill issue. Even the most skeptical of my chatters have forgiven me for this terrible slight because they witnessed firsthand the horror that is the bear. The bear is the first boss of Toytopia, and if you've only watched gameplay of or have played it when it first came out, you wouldn't have had any idea the trouble he's brewing. Yes, I stole that idea from Dynamite Heady. But the kicker here is that I played this game on March 1st. Toytopia received a patch on February 23rd, fixing bugs, improving optimization, and changing brightness levels. Nowhere in this patch note did they mention that they took the bear, injected him with steroids, locked him in a room, taped his eyes open, and then made him watch all 78 oh episodes of Song. Sonic X. And I figured that out for myself the hard way. Saving. That's never a good sign. <laughs> what? What happened? I don't even know what happened. Is this like a boss? Fuck! What? Damn, dude! Chill! Come on out, big boy. I'm waiting. Come on, don't be shy. There's not really much warning, is there? This game is ass. I don't know that's what takes. Dude! Get. Get lost. So, did I or did I not just flash him? Get. Get, get, get. Dude. Dude. Zero time to react to it. Am I gonna be able to beat this? And I can't, I can't, I can't, like, I'm turning around to try and, like, you know, I'm, like, anticipating, and he just comes from the other direction instead. Fuck. I'm... This is bad. This is bad. Bad game. Bad game. Bad game. What do the reviews say? Like, is this... <laughs> How does the person in the reviews do? Yeah, one of the comments says you gave the bear a Red Bull. They made the bear impossible in the patch. 
Yeah, so that's $8 back in my wallet. Unfortunately, that means you gotta deal with a few more pixels than usual as we trek through analyzing someone else's playthrough of this train wreck. Thanks to the channel Foxplay for dealing with this in my stead. Let's go! You're playing as a reporter exploring the abandoned amusement park, Toytopia, in order to be the first to write an article about it. Therefore, one of your gimmick tools this time is a camera that you can use to flash things. The viewfinder on this camera actually works, which is a nice touch, I'll give them that. I will also give them credit for the voice acting in this actually being decent. Close down a little over a year, go to catch this. Mysterious disappearances. The game begins in the amusement park's lobby. All there is to do here is to pull a lever that allows us into another lobby with a large rotating statue of this game's main antagonist, Wallace. Entering the door behind him leads us to a hallway with another Wallace and a small room, in which we can pick up a magic wand, which is the second gimmick tool in this game. Interestingly, with this in Playtown, it seems like developers are attempting to separate themselves by adding more than one gimmick tool. I think this could work if done right, but a trend I'm noticing is that they're really only ever used as glorified garage door openers. For example, the wand we just got has the function of, get this, opening doors if you swing it at them. Come on, you could've made it like Magi Quest, which is a real life version of what this game tries to be. Swinging the wand at different stuff could be used in puzzles or to fight a boss. This is a huge missed opportunity. Oh, it's the subscribe button. How'd that get there? <laughs> That's a terrible take. Also, as a quick aside, don't just explain everything with signs. A good puzzle solution is something the player should be able to come to naturally. Hints are fine, but signage like this can just break a player's immersion. Progressing on, the decoration of this place is desolate as heck. I really don't see any kid finding this comfortable. Heading down a slide at the end of this concrete hallway, we find a decently inviting, albeit small, play area. There is nothing to do here besides look around and eventually flash the eyes on the side of this ball pit as instructed by a sign. The pit opens and we can climb in, only to be jump scared by a fox mascot. We wake up after that in a new room with two things of note, a tape player and a set of large buttons. Playing the tape on the recorder has a frantic employee tell us the order to press those large buttons in, and doing so allows us into a hallway lined with train tracks. If we don't go in right away and instead use the wand on the door next to it, we can find a little easter egg room containing references to other games published by Mascot Bro Studio. This guy looks like how I felt playing these. In the middle of the train track hallway, we come face to face with you. <coughs> the bear is a lot more broken in this version, constantly getting stuck on ceilings and walls and just staring at you, silently begging to be put down. Maybe he was always supposed to be unfairly fast, but they just fixed his collision in the update? Successfully flashing him enough times triggers a cart to roll by that contains a lever that you can place on a panel in the colored button area outside. Now you can use that lever to open a different door that leads you down a, a cave? The children yearn for the mines, I guess. There's a puzzle here that the camera viewfinder comes in handy for. You'll need to use it to see a code written on a paper attached to a suspended box. That code can then be entered into the screen nearby to open the door to the theater. In here, we meet the fox again, whose name is apparently Ridoon. He can't kill you on contact, but you need to play his shooter game to progress, and refusing to do so by shooting him instead will get you killed if you're persistent enough. Winning opens the curtains, letting you press a button on the stage that opens a strangely placed door blocking a tunnel. In the tunnel is this guy! Give it up for this guy! What am I even supposed to say about this? Finally, we reach the end, coming to our final combat with Redoon, whose walk cycle has got to be the goofiest I've seen in a while. I appreciate you guys not using a pre-made walk cycle, but um, maybe you should've. You're supposed to die here, by the way, and doing so drops you into a room where your only task is to open a door again. In the new room, there lies the loudest easter egg known to man. You can even see the guy playing jump. We start to see a lot more graphics of Wallace as we walk here, and the reason soon becomes apparent. He's literally right here. I like this guy, mostly because his voice acting is half decent. What have we got here? And his design is inoffensive. He reminds me of has been hotels villains. I quickly begin to dislike him when he makes us do more platforming. At least the wand is used better here to move the platforms. More of that differing functionality, please. We clear the platforming and find a tape in the next room that mentions that these toys aren't even supposed to be moving or talking, which begs the question, why didn't anyone do anything about it? I guess it's not important. The point is that they're doing it now, and one of them is now coming from the back of the hall 
to murder us, so off on the obligatory end chase scene we go. Look at that swagger. Swagger is not enough to break a chain link fence though, so we are free to head on down a tunnel to the end of the game once we have dealt with the threat. As the game concludes, I'll say one thing about that chase. I am aware that Poppy Playtime does this as well, not introducing a villain as a live threat until they chase you in a cinematic ending. The difference between these two games, though, is one was essentially an introduction slash tech preview to a longer story, and the other is being presented as a full game. That costs money. A full game should build up to and explain its villains a lot more thoroughly if it wants to have staying power. Unless you're planning on releasing more parts to the story, in which case do I need to tap the sign? Once again, I feel like it's obvious I did not like this game. The game felt pretty disjointed and rushed, there was no real explanation for any of the characters, and they look far too similar to Poppy Playtime's and Five Nights at Freddy's characters, particularly in the designs of the nightmare slug thing from the tube looking like Night Marion and Redune looking like the fusion baby of Catnap and Huggy Wuggy. But rather than just ripping on Toytopia, let's get into a synopsis of all the reasons I've mentioned so far that all of these new mascot horror games aren't getting the fame the genre used to. I think it's pretty safe to conclude that despite mascot horror being as much of a trend as it's ever been, perhaps even more popular now with some recent standout releases, you're not going to become number one by slapping Unreal Store assets into a map and adding a crumpled up monster. Being bad on purpose or even just by by accident doesn't work anymore. The market for low-rate horror is beyond oversaturated at this point, and just following the crowd is going to net you about an hour in the sun at most. When Ban Ban came out, people saw it and went, there's no way this exists, right? But now we expect it. When we see the next attempt at a new Ban Ban, we think, oh, this again, and might not even click on it. That's why games like the three we looked at today haven't gotten big. The first person to do something well is going to be noticed. Freddy Fazbear came around when no one had seen killer animatronics in a game form yet. Huggy Wuggy came around when the formula of kids place gone wrong wasn't a common formula in games yet. These two characters became well known because of what new things they brought to the scene. I know it's scary to take a risk and learning how to make something new can be challenging. Game development is a risk-based career and it won't always work out, but when it does, won't it feel better to know you haven't made your career off copying somebody else? Even though I may be honest that these games are bad, I don't want to discourage any of the devs mentioned in this video from pursuing their dreams and I don't condone any harassment levied towards them for their creations. In fact, I look forward to seeing you guys make more games and come into your own. Sometimes it's just important to get a wake-up call. Still, putting out a finished game is an accomplishment no matter what. Tons of people don't even finish theirs. So please take my points to heart and put that heart into what you make next. I guarantee you'll be better off for it. Let's end off with some inspiration for your next games. Here's a few great looking mascot horrors in development and what I think are their standout factors. Funset Studios, an adventure based in a TV studio led by Fumbo the Hippo. It focuses on platforming challenges, uh -huh. reminiscent of shows like Legends of the Hidden Temple, Indigo Park, a romp through an abandoned amusement park with the help of Rambly the Raccoon. It stands out with how your assistant bounces between screens and cameras to track you and help you. Finding Frankie, face off against the stretchiest dudes in the genre in a parkour based attraction. Why do you do this to me? And don't fret, in a musical themed world, play as the mascot, fret the guitar to discover the mystery behind Harmonic Heights. Check those out, do your best, and of course, remember to hit that subscribe button and like the video, it helps a lot. Hey, did the button do that rainbow thing when I said the word? Please tell me, I'm legit curious. Thanks so much for the love so far. This has been Glamrock Dusky, and remember, have a fazerific day! You're playing as a reporter exploring the abandoned amusement. Ah! Oh.